Welcome to the Chip Happens Podcast, a podcast about construction, education, and everything in between. I am your host, Joseph Garibaldi, and I invite you to take a listen to a new and exciting podcast about construction and teaching. Thank you, guys. Uh, I'm really thankful you guys are listening to my first podcast. My name is Joseph Garibaldi. I'm here to kind of share some of my feelings about certain things. I am a agriculture construction teacher in California. I come from a interesting background, and I want to use this platform to share to my peers, my students, and to anyone who is interested in listening about construction, agriculture, and teaching. I grew up in San Jose, California. My dad was a tile contractor, and my grandfather owned a very successful concrete company. The the purpose for this show is really to kind of chronicle my thoughts and different problems or solutions I may have to these problems for students and for teachers and for anyone who might be struggling with different shop-related or agriculture-related or teaching-related problems. When I was going through teacher induction, one of my projects was to find sources or find research related to teaching. While this isn't a research report or any sort of backed research advice, this is kind of a chronicle of what I see and what I deal with. I want to give you ideas worth sharing. I have ideas worth sharing. I want to be able to give those to you. I teach right now in an empty shop and classroom and looking through and, and watching my students on a screen, I really see a need for a deeper connection to kids. Right now, they don't have connection, and they they miss that connection. In fact, when I asked my kids what's one thing they look forward to after the coronavirus, I don't know if you would call this quarantine, but the one thing they look forward to is coming back to school. That's amazing. I mean, the one thing I look forward to is getting kids back to school. And I think these kids need that. I need kids. They need me. You know, we need education, and it's so difficult, but... I feel like this is the perfect way to reach kids and any sort of educator who might be feeling the same exact way. My shop is run, and pretty particularly, if you are a teacher and you have a shop, you know exactly how your shop is run, or at least you have some idea. Right, COVID shop teaching is completely different. Uh, I have had to create new, exciting excitements. I have to have kids an hour a day involved in a subject that should be taught hands-on. I do have some ideas how to do it. This podcast is one. I have a YouTube channel. I actually named it after my grandfather's concrete company. I just kind of put another word in there. And you can feel free to look it up. It's California Carpentry and Construction. I've been filming videos around the shop, around my own house, around anywhere that I can film a video that will teach some sort of skill. And I film those videos and post them on there. Right. I've been seeing a need for a podcast for shop educators and students. And I, I've looked everywhere and I, I'm sure there's some out there, but I, I really just need to make one. And that's what I really want to do. And that's kind of my purpose. When it comes down to creating a shop-like environment for kids, there's so many things I do. I am making kids or I'm, I'm encouraging kids to work in their home. I think that's a really lost skill we have. I grew up with chores right and i got an allowance i got paid by my parents to do chores it's it's crazy i don't know if any kids do that nowadays but i know when i was a kid i got paid to do chores now did i actually get paid absolutely not that's kind of unfair because my my mom and, and dad definitely did a lot for me that is more than any sort of dollar amount that i can give but i think it's kind of insane that kids don't know what it's like to work for something They don't know what it's like to work for money. I I shouldn't say all kids, but I I get that feeling that kids don't quite understand what work is. And I kind of struggle with that, and I really want to make my kids work. So I created a work log. I only ask for 12 minutes a day or an hour a week is all I really ask for. I want kids to do something around their house, do something around the place they called home, and better that place, right? And ideally, I would love for them to build a fence with their dad or mom or, or grandpa or anyone, whoever they call their parent i would love for them to actually build something but we all know that some students just don't have the opportunity so why don't they sweep or pull weeds or do something to better their house many kids take my shop class because they don't want to be in front of a computer screen and i have to respect that i don't want to be in front of a computer screen in fact i'm sitting looking at a computer screen as i'm recording this and it's kind of like chains on me it's like I'm tied up, I'm shackled up because I can't 
teach the way I know how and the way I know that how my kids want to learn. I can't teach that way. But yet I do every day. And I think that's a testament to teachers is that, yeah, we, we're uncomfortable. We don't like teaching this way. We want to see our kids, but we can't. So we're going to make do with what we can. And I think that's an incredible testament to education and to teaching. I want to go back to ideas worth sharing. I think teachers really don't, or at least new teachers, I should say, really don't feel confident sharing their ideas. And I think that's a shame. I'm going to talk in a later episode about being a new teacher with young ideas and that struggle. I don't want to spoil that episode, but I want to touch on that. I want this podcast to be ideas worth sharing. And I want it to be a, a reference for any new teacher that you can do whatever you want, as long as it's for the betterment of our youth and our kids. And I think we forget that, right? Maybe we don't forget that, but we forget that whatever we are doing, whatever our goal is, it should be for the kids in our classroom or on our computer screen. Uh, COVID-19 has changed the way we teach, has changed the way we do a lot of things. And I think when it comes down to change, I think it's all about how we adapt to it. Uh, I've personally worked with teachers who are not adapting well to it. You know, they struggle with it. They don't understand how they're going to teach their curriculum to kids. And honestly, I struggled too. I struggled in March when we canceled school. I struggled with how was I going to teach my kids. I panicked for a good month or two. I didn't know what to do. You know, we, we have coaches, we have academic coaches, and they're fantastic. I cannot talk any more highly about them than I am right now. But you feel alone. You feel like no one quite understands your curriculum. No one quite understands your kids. And in reality, they really don't. They really don't understand your kids. They really don't understand your curriculum. And if you're a student watching this, the only person that understands you is your teacher in that class and your parents, of course. But your teacher in that class really gets you and they really understand what makes you learn. And I think that's the most incredible thing about teachers and about teaching is that we really want to tap into your brain and teach you something. So what was I going to do? Do I just sit back and let the impending school year kind of swallow me up? No, I, I thought of things. I had to just think, how was I going to get kids to do shop projects? Well, I can't be in contact with kids. I don't know what kids have at home. They could have a hammer. They could have a screwdriver. All they could have is a wrench. I don't know what they have. So let's rewind. How, what do kids come to my class for? Okay, yeah, to build projects. But they come for something else. And I think we miss that as educators. We miss that they come for us and for an opportunity to learn about something other than their normal topics like English or math. I don't want to discredit any kid or teacher who loves English and math. In fact, those two subjects are the foundation of education and the foundation of being successful in life. And even in my class, English and math are so important. So I don't want to discredit that at all, but math isn't practical until you come to my class. I give practicalness. I give hands-onness to math. When it comes down to creating invoices, to researching timber that can be used for houses, I give that hands-on feeling to English. When it comes to talking to customers, when it comes to selling yourself and selling a product, I give those hands-on skills that they learn in communications class or even a world language class. I give them a purpose for those skills. And I think we forget that. You know, shop teachers want to kind of pull away from the rest of the school, and the rest of the school wants to pull away from hands-on teachers. And I think we forget that we work hand-in-hand -hand together. There is not a subject taught at school that doesn't work hand-in-hand. -hand. There is something that could be there. I'm really thankful that my school focuses on literacy. I think literacy is so weird. When I was going through credentialing, I had a literacy teacher who just taught literacy and she could not determine the definition of literacy. In fact, let me look up the definition of literacy right now. The definition of literacy is the ability to read and write. That's not the definition of literacy, right? Yeah, uh, okay, the ability to read and write is great, but if you just Google the word literacy and you look kind of down, you'll see competence or knowledge in a specified area. That's incredible. That's what literacy is, right? Math literacy is different than English literacy. And English literacy is different than history literacy, right? I think it's so hard to teach without teaching about literacy, right? It's the understoodness of the subject area. And that's incredible. 
right? That's it. We, we teach kids how to be literate in each subject area they take. And so having a team that focuses on literacy and how we're going to track literacy in our kids is tremendously helpful. But I think we, we forget that. We want to push back because we don't think that English and math affects our classes. But in reality, it always does. I reach out to our math teachers on our site all the time. I ask them, hey, my sophomores are going to be doing area and finding area of houses. It's important for square footage when I measure for hardwood flooring, when I measure square foot for any sort of landscape. I need to know what grade they learn that so I'm not teaching too advanced for the grade level. Right? And if I email the geometry teacher and say, hey, how are your kids doing in this? He needs the confidence to tell me how they're doing so that I can take that and help him. Because they learn it twice. They learn it once in math, then they learn the practical. You know, When are we ever going to use this? They're using it in my class. When it comes down to creating invoices and writing professional emails to customers, I need to communicate with our English teachers on site and find out when they're learning those particular skills on how to be intellectual or how to be competent in email. I mean, I get kids all the time sending me emails in the subject line, and we laugh about that, but that's a problem. We also struggle with trying to bring the school together as a team. In fact, we naturally break out into departments. But what if, I'm, I'm just thinking at this particular point, what if we don't have departments? What if everyone worked together? What if you had a department that was just broken up, there was always an English teacher in the group, there was always a math teacher in the group, there was always a science teacher, there was always a hands-on teacher in that group? What if we redesign departments to look like that? Right? We redesign departments to be unique teachers that are helping each other teach the overall goal which is to get kids ready for college and a career. I teach more towards a career than college. And actually scratch that. I teach kids life skills. If they don't want to go to college, I hope they use my skills to better a home if they choose to buy a home. I tell my kids day one, the skills you learn in this class are not designed to help you in college. They could help you in college. They're not designed to help you in a career. They could help you in a career but they're designed so you don't have to call a plumber if something basic happens. They're designed so you don't have to call an electrician if a plug's broken. They're designed to know or to have that ability or knowledge to know when to call a professional. And I think that's probably the biggest goal that I have. And I think kids struggle with that understanding, that importance. And I think kids don't completely get it. And they're they're young, you know, they're they're not quite mature yet, but I can see it click in my juniors and especially my seniors. I can see that that part click is that, man, Mr. Garibaldi's teaching us something that we can use in life. I cannot begin to tell you how, I wouldn't say humiliating, but how disgraceful it was when I had a broken shower and I had to call a plumber to fix it. And I said, this will never happen again. Now, I'm not discrediting plumbers. They, they are fantastic individuals and they, they definitely deserve the pay they get. But it was such a basic problem. And so I said to myself, I would never have this happen again. I would, I would always know when I need to call a professional, but I would always learn how to do something. Now understand, this was a very simple problem. It was just a shower cartridge that needed to be changed. Also understand that if your water heater goes out, call a plumber. Anyways, that, that's just my point. I want to teach students not to rely on people and to rely on themselves. And how cool would that be? How cool would a kid be? It's, imagine if he has his own family. I have a very young son. He's seven months old. You know, we, we have to build a backyard fence at our house. We have to build a fence for our backyard. At first, we were talking about hiring someone. It wasn't that the skill on my art part wasn't there. It was that the time wasn't there. But how cool would it be if my son watches me build that fence? And how cool would it, I mean, he obviously isn't going to remember, but how cool would it be if your son watches you build a fence and he gets to tell his kids or he gets to tell his friends, me and my dad built that fence. I think that's awesome. I think that's so cool. And I think that's such an incredible experience. And I feel like we, we missed that part. We, feel, I, we missed that mark. 
You know, like we, what, what have we done that we have missed that mark with kids? And maybe we haven't missed that mark. I can't say, you know, for a hundred percent that we have, but I can also say that we, we've lost that ability to do basic things. I see the memes all the time about, uh, how millennials can't build a house, but baby boomers can. And then it's always some sort of smart comment below, but you know, I'm a millennial. Can I build a house? I think I could. Have I built one? No, but I think I could. You know, do I have that skill? I think half the skill is a book smart. Half the skill is like actually trying it out. And that's what makes my class so useful. So when it comes down to being literate and knowing the subject, you have to be literate with everyone. I don't want to sound like I'm knocking other teachers or even knocking the utmost respect for people in my profession, but I think we have to have ideas worth sharing. I think we can't be afraid of sharing these ideas. And I'll be honest, I'm afraid of sharing ideas sometimes. You know, so there's sometimes when I, I shoot an idea out to someone and they tell me I shouldn't work hard. I should I shouldn't think about it that much. I shouldn't I shouldn't reinvent the wheel. Well if the wheel is square, shouldn't you reinvent it to be a circle or round? I'm not reinventing the wheel, I'm making the wheel better. If your version of a wheel is square, but I take it and I make it a circle, wouldn't you want to use that? And I think that's where I have a hard time, is that I want to be better. And I feel like there are many teachers with ideas worth sharing, but they just don't want to share them because they are unsure about their ideas. They're unsure about how their ideas are going to be accepted by their peers. And understand, you have 24-year-old teachers teaching alongside of 70-year-old teachers. Three generations of teachers teaching shoulder to shoulder with each other. That's intimidating. You have someone who main focus of teaching was flashcards. And then you have someone who learned to teach using positive behavior reinforcement and differentiated instruction and scaffolded notes, flashcards, fill in notes right? Two completely separate beings or ways of teaching. It's incredible. And we just get scared of sharing ideas because we don't want to be different. Because sometimes being different is bad in some people's eyes, right? Sometimes having crazy ideas is bad. And I'll, I'll let you know, the idea of me making YouTube videos was thought as a crazy idea. Why would you put that much time, Garibaldi? Why would you... Why would you waste that time? Why would you put that money into buying cameras and buying microphones and making stuff? Well, the, I can't think of any way else to bring my atmosphere, my class vibe to my kids more than filming and recording myself. Sure, kids come to class because they like building, but I do have a lot of kids come to class because they like hearing what I have to say and they value me as an educator and as a leader in the classroom. They value me and what I allow them to do and what I challenge them to do. And I think that value is something incredible. I want to define leadership real quick. Leadership is the action of leading a group of people. Do I think of myself as a leader? No, I don't think of myself as a leader. I, I think the person who thinks of themselves as a leader isn't a leader at all. A leader indirectly pushes those to reach their goal. A leader has to have a clear vision, has to be courageous, has to have integrity and also humility. And I think we're too prideful. I think as teachers, a lot of us are very prideful to admit that we failed at something. I'll, I'll be honest, I'm afraid of failure, but do I let that get in the way? Sometimes, sometimes I do. Sometimes I let that get in the way of my overall purpose and my overall goal and that's shameful. But it's the truth, I'm afraid of failure. But what's most important is, I stand shoulder to shoulder with those that I lead. And I think that's what's really right. I think that is the purpose of a leader, is I don't wanna take credit for what my students do. I want my students to take credit for what they do. I want them to be praised for what they do. I'm just showing them the way, they are following the way. And I think followers need to be praised a lot more and they are, because they do the actual work to get to the goal. I'm just pointing them in the direction. Speaking of leaders, I want to again segue off a little bit. Teachers always 
have like a, a leader of the classroom or what they consider someone to be the leader. They might consider themselves to be the leader or they might consider another student or a group of students to be the leaders of the classroom. I don't know how I feel about that. On one hand, yeah, I'm the one who has the vision. I'm the one who, at the end of the day, I have a mark or an essential question or a standard they have to reach. And I am leading them towards this standard. But on the other hand, they're leading their own learning. I can present a platter of choices and skills, but they lead themselves to pick from that platter, to pick from what skill they need to accomplish the task I have put in front of them. A good classroom teacher, a good classroom leader, in my opinion, presents roadblocks that kids have to accomplish. One of my first projects was creating a birdhouse. Very simple, very basic. In fact, most teachers actually do birdhouses with their kids. And I think when it comes down to birdhouses and building stuff, I think kids don't really... I mean, they understand what a birdhouse is. They understand the directions. But it's like a Lego almost. So what a good leader should do is they should present a challenge. When I built a birdhouse, or when I had my kids build a birdhouse, I picked a cedar fence plank, which is standard. In fact, it's kind of the fence plank that everyone picks when they build a birdhouse. Cedar, in case you didn't know, cedar has a very quality where it does not like nails. It is very hard to nail something into cedar unless you drill a pilot hole that gives the nail a ridge or a pound. When I think about, when I think about challenge, Building a birdhouse may not be a challenge. It may be for some kids, it may not be for some kids. But knowing the type of wood and the quality of wood and what you should do is a challenge. So on their directions, I deleted the part where it said to make a pilot hole. Some may think that is bad and you're going to get a bad product at the end. And I did get some bad products. But what kids learned when they had to make their second project out of cedar, that nailing wasn't going to work. Do something different. And so they thought, how can we make this better? pilot holes right they pre-drilled that that's incredible like but they learned the first time when they made their birdhouse that it was horrible but they learned that they had to do it differently or else they were going to get the same result and that was all students that was all learning levels that was kids who have a disadvantage whether they don't learn the same as everyone else or they uh, don't speak the same language but they still learned that if they do the same thing, they will get the same result and they were not happy with the prior result. So they're gonna do something different. Now, not all of them pre-drilled holes, but most of them changed the way they nail in nails. They learned, don't put the nail on the, the annular grain of the wood, put it off to the side. It's less likely to split. If you pre-drill, it probably won't split. The kids learn and their second product was better. And I think purposely sabotaging a first project, I don't know of many teachers that do that. And if you do, please, I, I, I want to hear. Um, I, I want to hear how that worked for you. Because my second project, my goodness, my second project was amazing. I couldn't ask for a better project. I had very little kids that didn't succeed with that project. I had very little kids that got below an A in that project because they learned from the first one. I think that's an idea worth sharing. I want to thank you for listening to this podcast. I want to thank you for taking 30 minutes out of your day to listen to me. I hope you stick around and listen to more. This first podcast was kind of jumbled. They might all be like that, but I want to give you ideas worth sharing. And I want to give you guys a hope for this future. Because right now, we need a little hope. This has been an episode of the Chip Happens Podcast. Thank you all for listening, and I will catch you next week with another exciting episode.